So this is a Virginals by an Italian maker, Onofrio Guaracino. It was made in 1668, and it's an absolutely typical example of a domestic sort of keyboard instrument you would have had in the mid 17th century. Keyboard instruments then, traditionally, were more often than not plucked. So rather than a modern piano which hits the strings with hammers, this has little jacks, strips of wood under here, with a little quill sticking out that plucks the string. And this gives it its very distinctive, wonderful sound. Now this is a, a particularly fine example, and it's got this elaborate painting all the way around the case. But actually, the case is just a box to hold the instrument in. The instrument is just this beautiful, immaculately executed um, plain wood instrument in, inside. I could actually just lift it out of the box and put it on a stand by itself. But these boxes were made to obviously protect them, but also possibly to help produce the sound a little bit and direct it. Now, a keyboard instrument like this would have been at the centre of a nobleman's home or even just a, a wealthy amateur. And they were used for kind of everything at the time. They were used for um, dance music, they were used for singing along to, they were used as the heart of an instrumental group or at the heart of a vocal group. And we find that these instruments appear in beautiful scenes of the time in, in contemporary pictures. They, they're all over the place. Really rather remarkable. This example, as I've already said, is, is particularly fine workmanship. We can see these tiny little dovetails just on the inside where the wood is joined together. To do this, of course, in the days before, a very elaborate machinery took very sharp tools and a real skill. And this is a beautiful example of it. And also inside, we have a rose, a hole in the soundboard. And this, on this particular instrument, is made of a mixture of veneer and parchment. Veneer is very thin um, slithers of wood. And parchment, a, 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 a elaborate sort of paper construction, all layered up to make a very three-dimensional hole in the soundboard. It's an absolutely gorgeous example, almost more typical of guitars of the time than keyboard in instruments. That was a little Carenta, the fifth Carenta of a set by Michelangelo Rossi. It dates from about the 1640s. Um, we don't know very much about Michelangelo Rossi, but what we do know is that there's a collection of Toccatas and a collection of Carenti, and these Toccatas are astonishing, and the Carenti show lots of imagination. What Rossi seems to have been really doing was exploring tonality and exploring how far he could bend the bounds of tonality. The Carenti are a little bit more traditional, but still they have that wonderful twist of going from three to two in a bar and just always making sure that you have to slightly work out which foot you're on if you're going to dance to it. I mentioned um, a lot about the actual instrument, but it's worth just saying a couple of things about the case. One is the obvious lid painting. 
it's possible that the lid painting was put on slightly after the instrument and maybe at the instruction of the person who owned the instrument, maybe to go with their interior or something like that. We rather suspect that it isn't quite finished. A landscape like this may have um, traditionally had allegorical figures in it, and there are some um, possible uh, sketch marks showing where the, a coastline may be, have uh, intended to be added in. But whatever, it's still a very wonderful, very striking example um, of a rather sort of austere landscape um, and just gives a really rather wonderful visual focus to the whole thing. And then on the out of the case, of which we can just see the front flap here, we have this Pietro Duro effect. This is um, an imitation of um, basically precious jewels and stone inlay on the outside. And it was intended to make the piece of furniture, particularly when the whole instrument, the box was closed up, to make it look as though this was a really opulent piece of furniture. The execution is really rather wonderful and it would have looked an absolute a real sort of wonderful thing, a centerpiece to any room. But it's clearly this design, it's not quite the real thing, but a, a very wonderful example of how to slightly give the example of what it is you want to have. The next piece I'm going to play on this instrument is by Bernardo Storace. This dates from the later end of the 17th century, and it's a set of variations on what he calls le balletto. This is a, a rather wonderful sort of gentle, um, simple harmonic structure, and he just varies the texture. It's almost old-fashioned in the way he does it, but he uses some really rather interesting textures, particularly in the third and fourth variations, where we get the sort of hands, sort of almost like a chopstick version, and then we get a tripler time, again just hinting at the dance within.
That was a charming little piece by Joseph Haydn. It was for a set of pieces that he wrote in the early 1790s for an instrument called the musical clock. Uh, probably um, this was actually a specific mechanical instrument where the tunes were pinned onto a little barrel and then operated um, as a, a clockwork organ. Um, but they exist in manuscript and they sound just charming. And they really um, highlight the beautiful tone colours of this chamber organ. This is an instrument from the end of the 18th uh, or possibly the early 19th century attributed to Joseph Balaudi. It's an absolutely typical domestic chamber organ of the time. So you would have found this in a stately home, in a large um, mansion, possibly even in a, a small theatre. They were used in much the same way as we think of a, an upright piano today. They were used for kind of everything. Although we always think of churches having organs primarily, these instruments would have been used for singing in the home, not necessarily hymn singing, just any sort of singing. They were danced too. That's a, a strange concept for modern thoughts. And they were used for playing keyboard music. Um, just for general entertainment purposes. So it really was uh, a useful all-purpose instrument. Now an instrument like this of course has pipes and there are two different materials that make the pipes that give us different sounds. We have wooden pipes which are traditionally just a, a more mellow sound and metal pipes which have a more piercing and direct sound. This has a mixture of both. In fact the main register of the instrument, that's to say the main sound of the instrument, the one that sounds at normal pitch, is a mixture of both metal and wood. It's metal in the treble and wood in the bass. Partly that's to fit it all in this case, but also it's to create a nice homo homogeneous sound that's not too penetrating. There are two further um, stops or um, sets of pipes in this instrument. One tuned an octave higher, so-called four foot pitch, and that's made of metal on this instrument. And then one tuned an octave above that, the 15th. That's a slightly later addition for this instrument, but um, it blends in rather beautifully and works extremely well. Now, of course, pipes need air, and this is an instrument that was made before electricity was even um, a remote thought. So something has to get the air in. On larger organs, that would have involved roping somebody else in to help you, and they would have pumped off at the sides with a large bellows pump. But this one has only got a small bellows, so you can do it yourself by means of a pedal that's operated by my right foot. That's all great, except that there's one rule of pedalling, which is that you can't pedal in time with the music, otherwise you get surges of air through the pipes at the time. So you have to pump with your right foot out of time with the music, which sounds easier than it actually is. You just have to sort of switch that part of your body off and just let it get on automatically pumping the instrument. The other thing is, of course, you can't run out of air in the middle of a phrase. So you have to have some way of knowing how much air is in the reservoir of the system so that you're not suddenly going to run out of air, like um, a, a, a flute player running out of air in the middle of a phrase. And we have a gadget here, this little brass weight here, which is called the telltale. And as we um, pump the bellows, I'll do that now with my foot, you'll see the brass weight comes down and gives us an idea that there's air in the system. So I watch it as I'm playing out of the corner of my eye and see if it's going to get near the top and then I know I've got to keep pumping. So it is a wonderfully charming instrument, but it's worth just mentioning why we say it's attributed to Balaudi, because it's a very charming story, and only recently um, uh, the attribution was made during the restoration of this instrument. Inside the, um, the actual workings of the organ is what we call the palate reservoir, and that's uh, a large chest of air in which are contained the palates that open and shut when you press a key to allow air through the pipes. Now these are sealed to make them airtight, and they were sealed in the original makings of this instrument, they were sealed with a parchment, or a sort of a paper, um, a type of paper. And the paper that's been uncovered that was used for this were a, an old writing, a set of writing exercises by what looks like a, a young hand. And because we have another instrument that is sound, signed by the maker, Bellaudi, with exactly the same writing exercises in the young hand, probably Bellaudi's daughter, 
that's how we're able to think that this instrument must have been at least partly made by Bellaudi, if not completely made. The next piece I'm going to play is by James Hook. James Hook is a rather remarkable, um, wonderful pictures of him exist. He is a, a sort of rather kindly looking man um, who is extremely popular for his songs that he produced for the Pleasure Gardens of London, including the famous Lass of Richmond Hill. His music is just of a different aesthetic. It's very light, it's very charming, it's quite witty, and I think it must have caused quite a shock when it was played in church, because that's what this piece is, a voluntary played at church. The fact that his music was so popular is also um, given by the fact that this is Opus 146. That is the 146th set of music that he published during his lifetime. This is in two movements. It starts with an adagio, uh, which is a little bit like a, a rather sort of fanciful hymn tune, and then goes into a very lively allegretto.
I first got into early keyboard playing because I was a pianist and I was very lucky. I was, uh, I was at a music school in Manchester and um, I'd always liked, I enjoyed playing piano hugely, but I really liked Bach. I liked, uh, there was a prelude by Bach, the sixth from book one of the 48 Preludes and Fugues. And I just remember it because it was really cool. It had that really sort of driving bass line, which was really good. And I realized then that I just liked that sort of sound. And I was on holiday um, quite early on um, and we came across this musical museum in Kent called Finchcock's Musical Museum run by this wonderful couple Richard and Katrina Burnett and they made me so welcome as a uh, an 11 year old and let me play all the instruments and that's where I really discovered how wonderful early keyboards could be but particularly the harpsichord which was where I sort of first channeled all my energies um, and so it was just being immersed in this early keyboard world and with an attitude surrounding me that these weren't inferior instruments to what came later. These were perfect instruments in their own right. And the composers knew them and loved them and wrote for them and wrote in a special way for these particular instruments. And that always was just such an encouraging um, uh, sort of atmosphere to grow up in and, and it just it, it sort of enhanced and, and fed into my music making ever since this idea that that the these these instruments are uh, equipment and wonderful tools but and they're perfect tools for the job in hand providing you find the right job in hand and then you just have to explore and see what the instrument can do for you rather than impose your will on it and that's a lovely way of thinking about music and instruments particularly I was, uh, I lived at the museum and worked at the museum for Finchcox for an awfully long time, which was um, a very special way to grow up. I used to disappear uh, from school holidays and go straight down to Kent from Yorkshire where my parents are. and. Um, I would effectively make the tea, I think, for my summer holidays. My summer job was making the tea and, and um, generally getting under everybody's feet. And they let me play the instruments and demonstrate them to um, the members of the public because there were always, the house was always open and there was always music in the house. And so I was just playing in every corner on every instrument. Um, and so I think um, when I was, particularly when I was a sort of young teenager, the thing that... Um, that Richard and Katrina Burnett really um, liked me to do was to go off into the side rooms where the instruments that weren't necessarily fully restored or weren't in the best condition or had just acquired um, were and, and let me go and see if I could make some noise out of them and, and work out what they were going to do and how good they were and, and that sort of thing. So that was a very special time. Then as I got older, um, my responsibilities and my knowledge and my skills and experience grew, of course. So I was given other jobs. Um, my, the, the role that I spent most of the time in was as a, a kind of assistant curator, where I was assistant to first William Dow, who was the curator um, for most of my time there. And then lastly, for Dr. Alistair Lawrence, the um, director of Broadwoods, who was then uh, the, latterly the curator. Um, Bill Dow was mostly a, a, a harpsichord specialist, so he concentrated a lot from the earlier side of the keyboard instruments. So I learned an awful lot about harpsichords and early pianos. And Alistair Lawrence was particularly um, a specialist in more um, later pianos. So I learned an awful lot about later instruments and a, a great love of later instruments from him. Um, I also um, spent a lot of time um, learning basics of keyboard maintenance, things like putting strings on harpsichords and putting quills in harpsichords, making organs work when um, bits of paper have been forced down pipes and things like that. Um, and then t towards the end of um, my time at Finchcox, I spent a, um, time working in the actual museum side of things. What, the, what people who visited the museum wanted and how interested they were. I was director of development and, um, uh, and director of of, um, uh, of, of the sort of assistant director of the museum. So it was a very special time and, and wonderful to see all aspects of a collection like that and an incredible, um, an incredible resource for the public. And at the head of it all was were Richard and Katrina who were so generous with their 
particular house and their collection, just letting people play and, and discover things. And of course, as, as much as everybody else was learning from the instruments and, and the access to the instruments, so was I. Of course, working in an institution like that with the same people for the same amount of time um, does engender some uh, amazing memories. Some of them um, slightly cringe-making, some of them are just absolutely wonderful. When I first started going to Finchcocks, we used to do an open day on a Sunday that would start at two o'clock in the afternoon and would end when basically the last guests decided they'd had enough, which could be anything as late as nine o'clock at night. Um, and quite often um, it would end up that the last guests would be kind of invited for a drink because we'd all had enough and we were all sort of wrapping down. So I remember sitting on the lawn at nine o'clock at night discussing the finer points of what made a, a, a rather marvellous English piano from 1801 sound so marvellous with a, a, a very happy um, group of visitors who just stumbled on the place for the first time. And it made me realise that the experience and our experiences of, of visiting um, uh, unknown things uh, and, un and unexpected things are always enhanced by the people we meet, the attitude of the people who are sharing their love with you, and I think that's something that stayed with me forever. Um, lots of um, other um, slightly cringy examples. I remember on many occasions being um, woken up by the um, telephone ringing to hear that it, uh, a coachload of um, Dutch tourists had just arrived at nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning, straight off the ferry, and um, were expecting coffee and a tour of the museum. And the owners weren't there, and the curator hadn't opened up, and everybody had forgotten about them, and nobody knew about it. So we had to race around the house and pretend that it was all, well, get dressed first and pretend that it was all totally um, above board. And we, of course, they were expecting how wonderful, and, and managed to get coffee and tea out to them in record time. There were quite a few examples of those. Um, that was down to uh, the wonderful world of, of pre-email years. Um, the most sort of, the, the biggest learning experience and also the most cringeworthy and funniest um, memory I've got was being allowed to play um, a wonderful forte piano by Johann Fritz from about 1815. One of these wonderful Viennese forte pianos with all sorts of gadgets, including what we call janissary music, which are drums, bells, and cymbals operated by a, a foot pedal. So you press the foot pedal and the whole instrument, sort of percussion drum kit, kicks into life. And traditionally, we would play Mozart's Rondo alla Turca, the Turkish Rondo from the end of the Sinatra in A major, to demonstrate this. And this was always Richard Bennett, the owner's showpiece. And um, he played it every day completely wonderfully and brought the house down. One day he wasn't there, so I'd been entrusted to do my first ever Rondo alla Turca, a bit like being handed the keys of the castle. It was a very special moment. I was about 20, and... Um, I was, I'd really prepared for it because I knew what a big thing this was. Anyway, uh, the tour went very well and I brought them round to the Fritz Forti piano and was very sort of um, effusive in my bringing up this wonderful piano, which was an incredible instrument and still is. Um, and I sat down to play and as my foot got over the, got ready to play the drum, um, a mechanism, I was aware that things were a little bit wobbly, and, and but it was quite a frail looking instrument and a bit wobbly on its legs anyway. Come the first entry of the drums, bells and cymbals, I pressed hard with my right foot to operate this mechanism and the whole of the bottom mechanism of the piano dropped to the floor with this almighty crash. So what was supposed to be the sort of highlight of this tour and everything ended up with me groveling on the piano trying to reassemble all this thing with this terrible disaster and, and whilst talking to the audience of course there were 80 people there all waiting for their cup of coffee at the end of the tour um, so it was a fantastically salutary lesson in that everything that can go wrong in performance will go wrong and to be honest ever since then everything that has happened in performance has never been as bad as that so everything that can go wrong in performance has always been measured by the fact that the climax of my big tour was a total failure and um, but we had to get through the show somehow it's always good to remember these experiences